Yeah, so welcome everybody for uh, this week's uh, seminar, the Department of Marine Geosciences. Um, we moved from last week uh, in Canada to this week in Germany, and we are hosting Professor Martin Frank from Geomar Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research in Kiel. Professor Frank obtained his master's degree and PhD in geology at the University of Heidelberg in Germany under the supervision of Professor Augusto Manini. After one year short postdoctoral at the same uh, in university, he embarked for a four years postdoctoral research fellowship at the Department of Earth Sciences, University of Oxford. Then he obtained an assistant professorship at the ETH in Zurich for five years prior of becoming a professor in chemical paleoceanography at the Geomar Helmut Center for Ocean Research in Kiel, in which he is, the, he is today. Among the academic services of uh, Martin, it can be highlighted that he is a co-founder of the International Geotraces Program in 2001 and a full member of the steering committee until 2012. He also served as an editor of Earth and Planetary Science Letters until 2018. Professor Frank has participated in many research courses as chief scientist or co-chief scientist in several oceans in seas in the world, including offshore Peru, tropical Atlantic, Angola Basin, and Amazon Mouth. So with these words, we are welcome you and thank you. <coughs> yeah. Welcome everybody. Thanks, Nicolas, first of all, for the invitation to speak at Haifa. I would, of course, needless to say, be much happier if I were there in person. <laughs> but uh, due to the circumstances, everybody knows this is unfortunately not possible at the moment. So I'll do my best and actually tell you a little bit about uh, some work that we've been doing in the last in the last years and still doing. <clears throat> and as you can see from the title of my talk, I will actually talk about reconstructing past ocean circulation with radiogenic neodymium isotopes. <clears throat> neodymium isotopes have, been a, have become a pretty popular tool, I should say, um, to do reconstructions of past water mass mixing and also weathering inputs into the ocean. <clears throat> but it has, there's really been a boost since, uh, say, the beginning of the 2000s uh, when it was shown that you can extract seawater neodymium isotope signatures also from marine sediments. This was only this was before only possible from manganese crusts and they of course suffer from a very coarse resolution and you cannot actually say anything for example about glacial interglacial variability. So I will talk about that. Uh, well I will talk about our sediment work basically but also I will talk about applications and limitations. And this is because many people are now using it, um, but neodymium isotopes are not, not a very, not an easy tracer always. There can be pitfalls, and I will actually talk about a couple of pitfalls today as well. <clears throat> okay, without further ado, I actually go into my talk. Do you actually see my, uh, my arrow here on the screen? Yeah. Good. I'll be, I'll try, I will sometimes use it to actually point at something. Okay. Good. So the global thermohaline circulation, everybody has heard about that, I hope. Uh, uh, it's actually driven by the sinking of cold and dense water masses in the high latitudes down here around the Antarctic and up here in the northern North Atlantic. The dark shading here marks sea surface density. And you can say where, uh, see where the, where, the, where the shading is darkest. This is where deep water is produced in the present day ocean. <clears throat> this has led, or this, uh, this, this density distribution has led to a schematic view, a very simplified view here of the global thermohaline circulation, which is driven by sinking of water masses up here in the Nordic seas and in the Labrador Sea on the one hand, and here around the entire Antarctic, but with a particular focus down here in the Weddell Sea, where surface waters sink and flow along the deep ocean basins 
here from the North Atlantic all the way as a western boundary current along the continents of North and South America until they meet <coughs> the Antarctic circumpolar current and from there branch off in the deep ocean in the Pacific and in the Indian Ocean. And there's a return flow, of course, because this flow has to be compensated by surface uh, currents, such as indicated here with this, oops, I'm sorry, such as indicated by these red, red lines here, which is the return flow, and which is actually represented by the Gulf Stream up here in the North Atlantic. As I said, this is very simplified, and the physical oceanographers sometimes don't like that because it's too simplified. But in paleoceanography, we have to work with simplified uh, things, simplified patterns, because we cannot reconstruct fine scale water mass mixing and hydrographic parameters from the paleo records. So we have, to, we have to simplify things in order to do reconstructions. Okay, so this is how normally a physical oceanographer would look at this and how he would look at today's water masses. This is a profile through the uh, uh, Atlantic Ocean, a full water column profile at nine degrees south in the Atlantic, the tropical Atlantic Ocean. Sorry, this is a bit funny nomenclature. So uh, 1.5 is 150 meters water depth, 300, 800, 2,000, 5,000 meters down here. Okay. <clears throat> And you can see this is the lines of equal density, and you can see that clearly the water becomes more dense with water depth. This is what you would expect, of course. But you can also see these inflections, which represent distinct water masses, such as here the Antarctic intermediate water, which is a very cold but not very salt rich water mass, and here the North Atlantic deep water, which is highly, uh, highly, uh, very, uh, very much enriched in salt. Um, and therefore is denser than the Antarctic intermediate water, for example. Below that, there's a, another water mass, all very simplified, as I said, in the Atlantic, which is the Antarctic bottom water. Now, if we wanted to reconstruct past ocean circulation, the nicest thing would be if we had proxies for temperature and proxies for salinity, um, and then we could actually do paleo density, right? This, is, this would be the simplest approach that we could pick. Uh, which is theoretically, which is possible. The problem is that, as you can see here already, in, these, in, this, in the range of the deep water masses between 1,400 and 5,000 meters, the differences between in salinity and temperature between the different water masses are very small. And no proxy for paleo temperature or paleo salinity gives you a precision that is sufficient to really do paleo density calculations that have an error bar that's smaller than basically the entire range of deep waters in the Atlantic. Okay, so that's why this is not possible. And that's why we need an alternative proxy in order to do <clears throat> to deep water reconstruction and mixing of water masses to reconstruct those. Okay. Now, <clears throat> before, I, before I go into details, I will actually say a couple of things about the marine radiogenic neodymium isotope systematics, which is my proxy that I will actually talk about today. I will talk a little bit about present day water mass mixing as seen from the neodymium isotopes. I will actually also talk about reliability of some paleo archives. Yeah, I, as I said, I will talk about a couple of, well, problems as well, because it's, very, it's relatively easy to extract these neodymium isotope signatures from sediments. But, and you can also always measure something, but the question is, does this, does the, was, does the numbers, do the numbers that you measure, do they make sense or do they not? And that is what the, what the problem is. <clears> then <throat> I will actually present you a case study that we couple, published a, a few years ago on the reconstruction of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, the AMOC, over the past 150,000 years. <clears throat> And I will show you how reliable reconstructions are potentially from restricted basins. This is then going back to <clears throat> my present day work and also to geotraces um, where in which actually we've spent a lot of time and are still spending a lot of time to actually calibrate our neodymium isotope proxy to compare the numbers that we measure in the present day water column to those um, uh, uh, to, the, to the hydrographic parameters that define the water masses in the present day water column very precisely. 
sorry. Okay, now <clears throat> three words about radiogenic, radiogenic neodymium isotope systematics. Those of you who work in petrolo petrology will probably have heard that before. Um, so the, 100, the, the neodymium isotope 143 here is a product of the decay of samarium 107, uh, 147. It decays with a very, very long half-life of 106 billion years. So by any measures for us today, sorry, yeah, is there a question? Or is there, ah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so by any, by any measures, this is a stable isotope from a present point of view, but it decays at a very slow rate. And the differences in the radiogenic isotope ratios between 143 neodymium and 144 neodymium, which is what it's normalized to, they are significant and they are well measurable and they are dependent on the age of the rocks and the fractionation of the parent-daughter isotope ratios, in this case, the samarium to neodymium ratio during the formation of the continental rock, uh, of the continental crust. And I need to introduce a notation that I will use here in the talk, which is the epsilon neodymium notation. Those of you who work with oxygen isotopes or carbon isotopes know the delta notation. This is basically completely analogous to, to this delta notation, but it's not in parts per thousand, it's part per 10,000. Yeah? These neodymium isotope ratios differ sometimes only at the fifth or the sixth digit after the comma. And in order to have more handy numbers, one has introduced this absolute neodymium difference, which is basically the, the, the deviation of the 143, 144 ratio of a sample from that of the chondritic uniform reservoir here, the Chur value. <clears throat> uh, but that's just, this is how this value has been defined. It has, it could have been anything else, but this is how it's defined. Okay, so we will have full numbers uh, that are more easy to deal with, and I will actually use those in the following. You will see in a second how it works. Right, this is the last rock picture I, th I show. Um, basically, that's the typical radiogenic isotope signatures of rocks surrounding the oceans, because weathering introduces the neodymium um, into seawater. And you can see here on the right-hand side, there's a scale it ranges from absolute neodymium values of plus 13 here in the red to values around minus 42 in the blue. Our measurements are at a precision of on the order of 0.3 absolute neodymium units, also for seawater and for sediments. So we're well in business uh, if you look at this range of absolute neodymium values in the, in the rocks. <clears throat> you can also see there's very blue, very negative numbers up here, for example, in northern Canada and Greenland. These are Archean rocks, which are characterized by really, really negative signatures, which is important because this is the formation area, for example, of the North Atlantic deep water and the weathering inputs from, the, from Greenland and from northern Canada. They leave their imprint on the water mass in the end. Okay? This is where the water is in contact with the rocks. The other extreme is these red numbers here, for example, all around the Pacific. This is the mantle-derived basaltic rocks uh, that are originating from, uh, from the mantle, and they have very positive signatures. For our measures here, um, for, because we want to use this for oceanography, this is all we need to know to use the neodymium isotopes as a water mass tracing, okay? Because everywhere here uh, around the oceans where the water is in contact with the coast, you will have exchange and there will be signatures introduced that will uh, actually change the neodymium isotopic composition of the waters. <clears throat> right, now you, whoops, you might say, okay, well, what does this help then? If, if all the neodymium isotopes that I see in seawater look simply like the rocks around, uh, around the ocean, then, then that, this will of course not work. The point is that of course these um, that these neodymium isotope signatures that are introduced in these in the areas in the coastal areas where the deep water masses sink, this is where they will acquire their, their signature and then transport these signatures all across the, the ocean basins. Those numbers that are introduced close to coasts where no water mass is no no waters are sinking, they will actually not reach the deep ocean in most cases. Okay. 
So it's point is punctual sources such as where the deep waters are forming up here in the northern North Atlantic or here in the Weddell Sea, where the neodymium isotope signatures are introduced into seawater. And that's the result. Okay, what, what do we see here? This is kind of the classical, the classical picture uh, that Friedhelm, Friedhelm von Blankenburg compiled a couple of years ago. What do you see here? This is a section through the Atlantic from 60 degrees south to 60 degrees north. And the contour lines that you see plotted here is salinity. As I said before, the North Atlantic deep water is a water mass, is former Gulf Stream waters that are super cooled up here in the northern North Atlantic. Uh, and then they sink down and flow south in the Atlantic basin at depths between 2,000 and 4,000 meters primarily. And this tongue of North Atlantic deep water can now very clearly be seen in its salinity, in its elevated salinity. Okay. Above that, you have less saline Antarctic intermediate water, and below that, more dense Antarctic bottom water flowing north. So these compensate each other, um, and that's what determines the picture of the deep water mixing, deep water mass mixing in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, superimposed on this, there's profiles of neodymium isotope signatures measured along the track of the global of, of the Atlantic thermohaline circulation. You can see that in the core of the North Atlantic deep water, the high salinity, the salinity maximum, the neodymium, the absolute neodymium value is always close to minus 13. Yeah, this is, this is, this, this is the value that the North Atlantic deep water sinks with and is then distributed in the entire Atlantic. And you can even track it down here to 40 degrees south, where the salinity maximum near 2,000 meter is still marked by an absolute neodymium value, reaching values very close to these minus 13, okay? This is possible because the residence time in neodymium in seawater is only on the order of 400 to 2,000 years. So it's not um, completely homogenized on the one hand, but its residence time is also long enough not to be vertically exchanged and therefore erasing the water mass signatures completely. Yeah, you need this intermediate residence time that enables the water mass signatures to, to survive. And that is therefore, and this is basically now what you see, you see this tongue of negative epsilon neodymium waters flowing south and the counter flow, as you can see from these neodymium profiles here, is actually in more positive numbers because there's more Pacific water contained in the mixture of these two water masses, okay? That's as simple as it is. This is the basis of application of neodymium isotopes in the present day ocean, and it's the basis for the paleo-oceanographic reconstructions as well. <clears throat> yeah, this is quickly illustrating how the neodymium gets into seawater. It's actually mostly riverine input, either dissolved or particulate. It's exchanged with the shelf sediments. There's a bit of Aeolian input as well. And <clears throat> um, there's no hydrothermal input for neodymium, very important, yeah, because that would have a mantle signature, but all the hydrothermal neodymium gets stuck near the vent sites. It doesn't get into the open ocean. So this is the inputs and the outputs is then basically scavenging. So the, the neodymium is ultimately incorporated into particles and then transported here into the sediments or it is actually directly incorporated into orthogenic uh, uh, um, material such as ferromanganese crusts at the bottom of the ocean, right? So there we go. <clears throat> this is our pathway. And in between, on the way from in, going into the ocean from actually being deposited in the sediments. There's this water mass mixing process going on that actually enables us to use the neodymium isotopes as a tracer for water mass mixing. I will skip this. This is actually just illustrating that there's a lot of neodymium coming by, by dust, which is then partially dissolving in the surface ocean. And there's also a lot of dissolved, a lot of neodymium coming with rivers. This is a, a, an example from the Po River in, in Italy where you can see huge amounts of particles being introduced into the, into, the into the Adriatic Sea. And of those particles, then a certain fraction will dissolve and then actually contribute to dissolved 
to the dissolved neodymium in budget in seawater. Then you need archives. You need to actually go, well, in, if you want to do paleoceanography, you need, you need the archives to actually, that you can also validate that give you then the values of the former water mass compositions. This is either some orthogenic fractions, such as ferromanganese coatings of sediments, could be ferromanganese crusts for these long-term records, but neodymium is also incorporated in corals, such as this solitary coral here, or into fish teeth. Both, or all of those are archives that have been used or are used for reconstructing past neodymium isotopic composition of seawater. Ah. Okay, That's a that was a long introduction, but I promise to actually tell you a little bit about the basics before I go into specifics, all right? So I hope I have everybody still on the boat here, and now I'll try to show you some data, first of all. <clears throat> Okay, I thought because this is a meeting uh, of a talk in Haifa, I thought I'd start with some Mediterranean data here. Okay, <clears throat> so this is water column data now. Okay, this is a section denoted down here from the Strait of Gibraltar on the left hand side all across to the Western Mediterranean here <clears throat> on the right hand side. And it's a full water column profile or a section from zero down to 5,000 meters. Yeah, <clears throat> this is from a geotraces cruise uh, that I've been involved in and for which I also measured samples and we just submitted this manuscript with the data. So what do we see here? Well, in the upper plot, you see salinity, which as you probably know better than me is much higher in the Western Mediterranean, of course, than in the Eastern Mediterranean. But you can also already see here, there's uh, water mass such as the Levantine intermediate water which is characterized by a very, very high salinity, which is then in the Eastern Basin mixing with incoming Atlantic water. Uh, <clears throat> and these two, these two are then actually mixed within the Mediterranean. There's also vertical exchange, there's deep water formation, all kinds of processes. If you look at the epsilon neodymium distribution in the, uh, along the exact same transit, you can actually see that these look quite similar. Yeah, you see these Atlantic waters with the values around minus 10 to minus 12 coming in here at the eastern, uh, at, the, um, at the eastern Mediterranean, at the western Mediterranean. I'm sorry, I mixed this up. <laughs> yeah, this is of course the, uh, the western uh, Mediterranean here. You can see this tongue of water from the Atlantic coming in. There's also obviously some vertical exchange. And on the other side, you can see these very positive epsilon neodymium values marking, for example, here the Levantine intermediate water. Around, uh, around minus five, which actually is a consequence of a lot of mantle-derived radiogenic rocks um, pre uh, 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 outcropping here in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean and therefore uh, uh, determining the neodymium isotopic composition of the water masses, okay? But still on top of that, you, this, is the, this is the trital input, yes? Yeah? So you see there's a lot of high, uh, red numbers here on the, on the right-hand side. This is not all water mass mixing. This is exchange with land, which is then distributed into the open, into the open Mediterranean. But the water mass, it's the Levantine intermediate water, is clearly marked by these really positive signatures. And you can see that all the waters that are flowing here, this is still Levantine intermediate water, is always uh, marked by this actually very positive signature, which is overlain by much more negative signatures originating from the Atlantic. This is the principle how it works and how I showed you it works in the Atlantic and on smaller scale also works in the Mediterranean. To a large extent, actually, this is also conservative mixing mainly once you're in the open Mediterranean Sea. Yeah? Surprisingly, despite the fact that it's such a small basin, and there's so much terrigenous inputs, it's still in the deep waters and intermediate waters is mainly conservative mixing. This is another example. This is now, we're going now to the Southern Ocean. This is the Southern Atlantic between around 60 degrees, uh, be, be, between <coughs> around 40 de for, uh, 50 degrees south and 65 degrees south. This is a section across the Atlantic circumpolar current, uh, the Antarctic circumpolar current. And just to actually put you here, uh, or actually emphasize this pattern here, this is basically the tongue of North Atlantic deep water with the, with the high salinities 
which is also marked by low epsilon near, near dimium numbers superimposed here. So you can see even down to 50 degrees south, this, the near dimium isotopes still track the advection of the North Atlantic deep water. All right? So this is all present day ocean. But now we want to go paleo. OK, I said that already. We can skip that. <laughs> yeah, but this is, this is then what we have to deal with when we, when we go paleo. And we can we extract the dissolved near dimium isotope signature of the deep waters from the iron manganese coatings of, the pel of pelagic sediments to reconstruct past North Atlantic deep water entrainment into the ACC. So this is a record here from the Cape Basin. So basically, at this water depth of something like four and a half thousand meters, <clears throat> this is present day circumpolar deep water, right? This is the mixture between Atlantic and Pacific waters that prevails in the deep circum Antarctic Ocean. And now you can see this is a section for the past 70,000 years. So from, from zero down back to 70,000 years. And what, I've did, what I marked here is the Holocene, the last glacial period, the uh, marine isotope stage three and marine isotope stage four. Last glacial being a full glacial, Holocene being a full warm period and the other two being kind of intermediate um, climatic stages, not fully cold, but not fully warm as well. But what you immediately see, <clears throat> if you look, if you look at the neodymium isotopic signatures um, in the Holocene, you can first of all see that these values around minus 8.5, around minus 9, very nicely fit <clears throat> what the deep waters look like today. Yeah, it would be bad news if the sediments were actually showing a different number <coughs> than our deep waters today. So this confirms the neodymium isotopes in the sediments conf uh, uh, really preserve a deep water near dimium isotope signature. But when you now go to the last glacial, you can see that the values have become much more radiogenic, much more positive. Okay? And the standard interpretation for that would now be that because this water is today uh, a mixture of about 50% Atlantic and about 50% Pacific waters. Yeah, Pacific waters being more positive in the epsilon neodymium, Atlantic waters being more negative, <clears throat> resulting in a present day value around minus 8.5, minus 9. And in the last glacial, the value were as low as minus 6. The interpretation would now be, well, it seems that in the last glacial, there was less North Atlantic deep water advected into the Southern Ocean and mixed with the Pacific water um, to form the deep waters. Okay, so there's a smaller fraction of North Atlantic deep water admixed, and therefore the interpretation uh, has been that this water, that this, uh, that the thermohaline circulation in the Atlantic was weaker because there was less Atlantic water exported to the Southern Ocean. Okay. You could also argue, well, maybe there was simply more Pacific water going into the mixture, <clears throat> but there's indications that the Pacific water fraction or the Pacific water export has not changed significantly on glacial into glacial timescales. So it is actually the admixture of North Atlantic deep water that produces this section, uh, produces these values, indicating a weaker and a more sluggish thermohaline circulation in the Atlantic in the last glacial. Now, okay, this was actually, as I said before, the two, at the beginning of the 2000s, there was a bit of a boost for the, for the neodymium isotope uh, work. Uh, and that was actually partly produced by, the, by this paper published by Randy Rutberg at the, in the year 2000. <clears throat> what we now did a couple of years later, 2015, we produced a high resolution record in <clears throat> the Central Atlantic at the, at the Bermuda Rise. Well, this is more than this is actually already the North Atlantic, 4,500 meters water depth. This is today bathed in North Atlantic deep water. Yeah, you have water, you have signatures here. This is the Holocene, the, the stage one over here. You see values around minus 15. So, this is basically what you would expect for present day North Atlantic deep water. Okay. <clears throat> and then you have 
yeah, this is this up the peak, the, the curve up here is the oxygen isotopes from the from the North Grip ice core in Greenland. This is just for reference of the timing. I will not actually talk about this today. <clears throat> um, but just look at the neodymium isotope curve now for the for this uh, for this instance. And what you can see here is that at about 20,000 years ago, you, the, the neodymium isotope signatures also became much more positive. You had values between minus 11, minus 10 here in the, in the peak glacial stage two and also in peak glacial stage six. Whereas in the Holocene and also in the Eemian interglacial, you had values similar to today, minus 15, okay? But then, and that was to our surprise, we found values in all these in this cold period, basically, between about 20,000 years ago or 25,000 years ago and about 110,000 years ago that were very similar to present day values. So despite the fact that the climate was much colder, it seems that the thermohaline circulation worked in a very similar way uh, compared to today. All right? This is what these, what these neodymium isotope values would show. What the neodymium isotope data do not show us, they don't show us how strong the exchange was. We can only say which water mass is mixed with, which, with other water mass, but the strength of the exchange, we cannot say anything. But we can if we use this productinium thorium proxy. Some of you may have heard this, at least those actually who work a little bit on oceanography, because it has also been a pretty um, widely used tracer these days. And in the, in the Atlantic, this is how it works. We have a constant production uh, radio, from the radioactive decay of uranium-35 of productinium-231 and a constant production of thorium-230 from the production of, from the decay of uranium-234. If, if you leave the water alone and only look at the production ratio, you get a ratio between the two of 0.093. Okay, this is no removal nothing, uh, no, no, no fractionation between the two at all. But we know that thorium is much more likely to stick to particles. It's much faster removed from the water column than the, than the productinium is, which means <clears throat> all the thorium is immediately transported to the sediments, whereas the productinium, which is less particle reactive, can actually be transported with North Atlantic deep water from the North Atlantic into the Southern Ocean. Protitinium likes very much to stick to biogenic opal, and once it reaches, it reaches the opal belt in the Southern Ocean, it will be absorbed to particles and then be removed to the sediments. Okay, so <clears throat> what you have is a loss of protitinium up here when the North Atlantic deep water is strong, and you have a smaller loss or no loss when the North Atlantic deep water, so when the removal of the productinium from the North Atlantic to the Southern Ocean is weaker. Okay? So we go back to our data, and this is the productinium to thorium curve down here. You can see that basically also through the glacials, in most, in, in most of the time, this productinium to thorium ratio is, has, shows very, very low numbers similar to today. These, would, these numbers indicate there's a strong North Atlantic deep water flowing southward, actually, and, uh, and gives reference for a strong Atlantic thermohaline overturning circulation. You, you keep losing the productinium from this location in the North Atlantic to the Southern Ocean. <clears throat> it's only during these Heinrich events when the, there was basically almost a complete shutdown of the North Atlantic, uh, of the, of the, of the thermohaline circulation because our Values, actually, they reach this production ratio of 0.093 um, during these Heinrich events 1, 2, and also during Heinrich 11 back here. Means you did not export any productinium from the North Atlantic into the Southern Ocean. And this is taken as a, as a reference for a shutdown, basically, of the, of the uh, thermohaline circulation. <clears throat> so if you look at this in a bit more detail now, and just actually calculate the average productinium to thorium values and the average neodymium isotope values for each of those climatic stages, you can actually see that the warm stages, here, marine isotope stage one, so the Holocene, marine isotope stage five, but also four, they've always been 
in this lower right hand corner, which indicates a strong overturning and a strong export of North Atlantic deep water. We have the uh, the cold mode, basically, this is marine isotope stage two and six, where the neodymium isotopes become much more positive. But at the same time, the productinium to thorium ratio still indicate a significant export of water to the Southern Ocean, yeah, because the productinium thorium stays at these low values. It's lower than production. So it indicates, so I have, I have values in the, in the neodymium that, that look very different and indicate a different water mass structure, but the overturning was still strong. And it's only during these Heinrich stages one, two, and 11, when actually the neodymium isotopes were also more radiogenic, but the productinium to thorium ratios reach production values. So no export of North Atlantic deep water during that time. And this is now, this results in our, in our schematic model in our, uh, uh, that we actually have reconstructed here. And <clears throat> so you can see, this is the warm mode up here. You have the Gulf Stream coming, sinking here in the North Atlantic, all the way to 4,500 meters where the core location is. And then actually continuing southward as North Atlantic deep water, while actually underlain by Antarctic bottom water, which is even deeper in the Southern Atlantic. <clears throat> in the cold mode, yeah, where the, where the epsilon neodymium numbers become more radiogenic, three, four epsilon ne neodymium is more radiogenic, you can see <clears throat> that the North Atlantic deep water obviously was not dense enough to reach the, 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 the depths of this sediment core. Yeah? And uh, the productinium to thorium at the same time, the low values still indicate that the, the, over, the, the overturn, the exchange of water was really strong during this, during the, during the, in this cold mode. And this leads us to this, uh, to this figure where, we, where the, the North Atlantic deep water put, uh, flow to the south was very strong, but not as deep as during the warm mode. Yeah? While at the same time, most of the deep Atlantic was filled with Antarctic bottom water or a water mass actually with a higher fraction of Pacific water dissolved in it. Okay? So this is our cold mode and only during this off mode, basically during these Heinrich events that I illustrated before, we had <clears throat> a signature that was actually indicated no arrival of North Atlantic deep water from the north. And at the same time, the productinium to thorium ratios indicate that there was only a very sluggish circulation. Well, the question is, can we really draw an arrow at all at that point? Uh, you can argue, <clears throat> but certainly there was a weak thermohaline circulation. This is the idea how we can use the, the neodymium isotopes at best compared, uh, combined with some other traces to reconstruct the, the, the circulation in the past. <clears throat> this is the simple interpretation. Of course, things are not always as simple as you would like them to be, okay? Because, for example, if you go, if you go back, if you, uh, can I go back? Chuk, chuk, chuk. Hello? Now, it lets me go back, sorry. <laughs> you can see, there is a couple of values here that are even less radiogenic, even more negative uh, than our present day North Atlantic deep water. So obviously the weathering inputs in the North Atlantic have actually at least for short periods of time also varied quite strongly. And then it's always a problem, of course, because you need to know your end members. You need to know what the North Atlantic end member and the Southern Ocean end member <clears throat> what those were in order to reconstruct paleo water mass mixing, right? This is always what we struggle with in, in, when we apply these traces. We need to know what the end members were. <clears throat> and this indicates that there, at least for some periods of time, the end members may have changed. And this is now, there is rising evidence that the, that the, neodymium, that the end members were even more variable than we thought before. So, the easiest, in, in the, well, to just repeat, the easiest, the easy interpretation of what I just showed you was that we have a warm circulation mode that prevailed during most of the past 140,000 years, including the glacials. We had a cold circulation mode that only prevailed during the peak glacials, such as glacial stage six and glacial stage two, <clears throat> where the overturning was strong, but the overturning cell was shallower. And <clears throat> We had an off mode during the Heinrich events with 
uh, which actually occurred within the peak glacial periods where there was no export of North Atlantic deep water or no significant export of North Atlantic deep water to the Southern Ocean. And this is now challenged a little bit by this one. <clears throat> this is a paper that came out last year by Zhao et al, who actually took a similar section. This is from 50 degrees north to 50 degrees south in the Atlantic. This is all sediment data. So people have extracted the epsilon neodymium from sediment cores from different water depths <coughs> representing the last glacial maximum in the Atlantic. So what you see is you still have much more negative numbers up here in the north, like you have them today as well. You have more positive numbers up here, uh, down here in the south, where there's more Pacific waters admixed, but the numbers were overall much different. Yeah, you had a minus, you have a minus 10, a minus 11 up here in the north. Today you have a minus 13, or minus 13.5. And you have a Pacific values <coughs> down here, which are around minus five, uh, south, Southern Ocean values are around minus five, minus six. Similar, this is a similar gradient compared to what we had today. And therefore people have had, uh, have had the idea, well, maybe, uh, this interpretation was too simple and maybe just the end members in both cases uh, switched to more positive values. And this is something that we found as well in a paper that we published this year. You can see this is a, a section here through the South Atlantic between, or through the Atlantic between 20 degrees north and 50 degrees south, quite a number of, of data points, also really from, again from sediments recovered from different water depths. And you can see on the left hand side here, this is a composite profile basically. <clears throat> this is present day, the red numbers, is, so this is the surface sediments. Yeah? Where you can see in the South Atlantic values around minus 11 prevailing in the core depth of the North Atlantic deep water and more radiogenic, more positive values down here at the values <coughs> uh, representing circumpolar deep water or Antarctic bottom water. You have this step function in here. This is today, this is the percentage of southern source water in the present day ocean. And you can see that the depth below 3,500 meters is really occupied by waters from the south. This is basically southern uh, um, circumpolar deep water or Antarctic bottom water primarily. Yeah? <clears throat> and the gray line back here, this is water column data. From a, from a station close to this sediment transect here as well, confirming that what you find in the sediments is exactly what you also see here um, in, the, in the water column today. Now, if you look at the last glacial, so if you take the same sediment course, you analyze the glacial sections for their neodymium isotope composition, you see that they're all more positive, yeah? Which is fine. Yeah, this is uh, this is what we've uh, what we've seen before, but what you see is also that there's a constant offset for all water depths, and there's also this step between the two water masses at around 3,500 meters, with more positive values down here um, below 3,500 meters, and more negative values up here um, up below, uh, above 3,500 meters. So and people have now actually, or the interpretation of that would be, well, <clears throat> you can very nicely explain this by just a modification of the end member signatures in the North Atlantic. Yeah? If the North Atlantic has become more positive uh, by three epsilon units, then what you see here is still a similar water mass structure during the last glacial maximum. And as the productinium to thorium values have actually shown us from the other core, probably strong, a strong exchange. So <clears throat> it means that the discussion whether the glacial thermohaline circulation was strong or actually or what the structure looked like has not been finished. And we need to actually do more work to really, really fully constrain what the end member signatures of the two main water masses mixing what they were. Okay, this is the key to understanding how strong the thermohaline circulation was in the past and how actually how it changed its pattern. Okay. Now, I have much more, many more slides on, on different things, but I actually think I've talked, I've, I, <laughs> I'm progressing much slower than I thought. 
So I will actually cut this a little bit and I will show you some data, some recent data that we uh, obtained in the north, in the southeastern Atlantic <clears throat> to show you what the potential of that area is for near dimium isotope research. So I will click through a number of figures here without saying much, yeah? And then come back to this one. Sorry? Yeah, because <clears throat> I thought I'll progress more quickly, but well, this is what it is. <clears throat> this is data that we obtained um, on a cruise, on a geotraces cruise in 2015, here in the Southeast Atlantic Ocean, right? This is the Angola Basin, this is the Cape Basin, this is where the Antarctic Circle Polar Current flows past South Africa, and this is where we all took stations along, uh, along the cruise track of this, of this cruise. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to show you a, a section, actually, sorry, say again. This is now from, a, from the part up here where we actually were close to land. Yeah, so there was a, there was a cruise track here also following the, the coast of South Africa, uh, South, uh, uh, South Africa all the way up here to about three degrees south and then uh, uh, going across. And this is what we look at first, because this point here, over here, at six degrees south, <coughs> This is where the Congo comes in. The Congo is one; it's the second largest river on the planet, and it brings a lot of material, a lot of dissolved uh, rare earth elements, a lot of a lot of particulate rare earth elements. And our interest was in how far and how how far away from the mouth does it actually affect the water column signatures of the neodymium and the neodymium isotopes. And is it possible to use the waters below the Congo plume still for water mass mixing? Okay. And this is what's plotted here. The upper plot is basically the um, epsilon neodymium distribution from the mouth of the Congo over here on the right hand side, all along and then across uh, uh, up to about uh, the zero meridian. And you can see that the surface waters here are super unradiogenic, super negative signatures in the upper water column all the way. And this is almost 1,500 kilometers away from the mouth that you can still follow the plume. It's, it's up until about here, so the, the flume, plume of the Congo by its neodymium isotopic signatures, right? So this, this negative signature is transported over very long distances. At the same time, you can see <clears throat> that the waters below the plume directly underneath here, yeah? They're also very negative, yeah? You can see that the waters really um, reach very, very low values all the way, uh, especially here and, uh, along the shallow part of the section um, along the shelf. <clears throat> Means that you cannot actually use the um, neodymium isotopes here as a water mass tracer because you're too close to the source. Yeah, so this will all be dominated by the inputs from the Congo and will all be, um, oh, the, the, it, the, the, the Congo material will completely overprint um, the dissolved water mass signatures um, because there's not only the, surf, the, 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 the fresh plume uh, that is actually restricted to the upper 10, or, well, 20, 30 meters, yeah, but the Congo also brings the particles and these particles sink down in the water and actually release this unradiogenic, this negative neodymium signature uh, to the water column below. It's, the question was now, well, can we at least here out here in the open uh, Southeast Atlantic use uh, is the, uh, the deep water signatures? Because this is, well, it's, it's under the, or affected by the plume, but should be far enough away <clears throat> to not be affected. That's why we calculated this delta epsilon neodymium value here, which is basically the difference between the neodymium isotope signature expected from water mass mixing. If you look at the hydrographic parameters, such as temperature and salinity, and what you actually measure in terms of epsilon neodymium signature in the water. <clears throat> and what you can see here, this is goes from minus one, minus two, minus three here in epsilon near, in delta epsilon neodymium. But despite the fact that you are uh, that this all these signals are look reasonable also from a North Atlantic deep water point of view over here at, at 2,000 meters water depth, 
they're always, all of those are two to three epsilon units or one to three epsilon units too unradiatory, too negative compared to what you expect from pure water mass mixing. Means if you're close to the, close to such a big river like the Congo, you can actually not use the water, entire water column for, for using water, for doing water mass mixing and reconstructions of oceans, also of ocean circulation in the past. You have to keep away from these major inputs because uh, they will simply overprint um, the, the water mass mixing signatures. If you, allow, if you now look at this one, at this profile down here at the zero midrange and then across here, this is now <clears throat> outside the, the influence of basically most detrital or inputs from land. Yeah, so, so this actually should, uh, this area should actually give you uh, signatures that are usable for, for reconstructing water mass mixing. And this is what I'm going to show you now. This is the data. <clears throat> On the left hand side, you see the, um, so now I have to actually put my glasses on myself. <laughs> so on the left hand side, you see the neodymium isotope signatures of the north south section here from about the equator all, 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 all the way to something like uh, 45 degrees south. This is two, two sections, two cruise sections basically combined. And you can see <coughs> here that the neodymium isotope signatures very nicely mirror the northward flowing Antarctic intermediate water. You see the incoming and North Atlantic deep water with this bulge of, of more negative waters. And again, the Antarctic bottom water flowing north with the more Pacific values and the more positive values coming here. You do also see though that there is this blob in the middle of the, of the Angola Basin with very negative waters. And I'll come back to that in a second, okay? If you look at the, at the Southwest profile down here through the uh, Southern Angola Basin and the Cape Basin, you can see very nicely that the neodymium isotopes capture these water masses, Antarctic intermediate water up here, upper circumpolar deep water, North Atlantic deep water and lower circumpolar deep water by very pronounced neodymium isotope differences, okay? These dashed lines are actually not drawn based on the neodymium isotope compositions. They are drawn based on hydrographic parameters, okay? But they fit very nicely uh, to what you see in the neodymium isotopes. So this looks positive, yeah, in terms of uh, use of neodymium isotopes, except this one, except this blob of, of more, very negative water in the middle of the Angola Basin, which is more negative than you would expect from the admixture of the North Atlantic deep water itself, okay? So this is, again, an area where we have to be careful. <clears throat> and we, again, did this delta calculation. So we calculated the difference between the expected and the uh, observed neodymium isotopic signature in the, in the water. And you can actually see, if you look at this figure here, up here, I just wanted to look at the, at the uppermost two figures. You can see here that you have this blob of, of uh, negative, of, of delta values that are negative by two to two and a half epsilon units. Yeah, so obviously there's some water from the coast. It's not the Congo because the Congo goes north. It does not go into the central Angola basin, but obviously there's some water from a little bit further south where there is, um, material from the unradiogenic coast being exported right into the center of the Angola Basin. This is a, there's a plume of uh, trace metals from the coast enriched in iron, for example, that has been observed in the area before, which exactly um, is on top of, of uh, plots on top of that location of more negative epsilon neodymium signatures in the central Angola Basin. So even when you're far away from the coast, and there's efficient pathways of material from land, you're sometimes not safe uh, <coughs> from lithogenic influences from land. And you have to be very careful about this when you're trying to interpret your data in terms of water mass mixing, okay? And you can see the rest of the water column in both in the, um, in the Angola Basin. There's a, a quite a number of blue also up here where there's material obviously from the coast dissolving. Whereas in the, in the southwest section down here in the Cape Basin, you see all these values are basically within error of the neodymium isotope signatures you would expect from water mass mixing, okay? So this is where we think we can use them. 
a little caveat at the very end. <laughs> if you look at the near epsilon, at the delta neodymium concentration, you can see that in the deep Cape Basin, um, there is too much neodymium. Uh, there's an excess in the neodymium concentration. So we know that most deep waters are enriched in neodymium. This is a, a common, a, this is commonly occurred a, 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 a met a, a pattern. And, and the question now is: This sufficient to ir to actually also document a non-conservative effect in the in the neodymium isotopes? Well, if you look closely, there is about five picomolar difference down here in the deep waters, and the concentrations you have down there is something like 30 to 35 picomolar. And that actually confirms or, or tells us, well, we can actually use those uh, epsilon neodymium values for water mass reconstructions because these small deviations, even if the neodymium isotope signatures of the uh, neodymium that's basically released sometimes from the bottom um, is too small to completely turn uh, erase the, the water mass mixing signatures. So it's still, especially here in the Cape Basin and in the Angola Basin, both, valley, both basins work nicely in terms of uh, neodymium using neodymium isotopes as water mass mixing parameters, <coughs> except for the central Angola Basin, as I said before. This is also compared, if, I look, if you look at the surface sediments, we always have to, yeah, if you want to do sediment work, you better make sure that your sediment values that you extract meet what you expect from the water mass mixing uh, signatures in the deep waters. And you can see that actually this is the absolute neodymium from the sediment. This is the absolute neodymium from the bottom waters. And you can see that in a range from 800 meters all the way down to <clears throat> something like 5,000 meters, we're very close to a one-to-one -one line and <clears throat> with some, well, with some attendance to potential non-conservative uh, non effects, you can use the uh, neodymium isotope, certainly in the Cape Basin for reconstructing past uh, water mass mixing. All right. So to wrap this up, <coughs> so radiogenic isotope, radiogenic neodymium isotopes are a powerful geochemical proxy for present and past water mass mixing because, and this is why they're also a valuable component for, for present day ocean circulation because they give you a provenance indicator. They can tell you if the geology on land was sufficiently different where the water uh, was last in contact with the land. Okay, this is something that the physical oceanographers, based on their temperature and salinity uh, data, cannot always do. Okay, and this is where neodymium isotopes can actually also provide additional information. Although normally, if you have reliable uh, temperature salinity data in the open ocean, then the TS diagrams are probably more reliable than, than looking at neodymium isotope numbers. But the physical oceanographers cannot go paleo with the, with the temperature and salinity, as I explained before. And this is why the neodymium isotopes are a valuable uh, water mass mixing tracer for the past. We can only use it, or we can best use it, if the water mass exchange and mixing processes of the water mass are fast. The longer a water mass stays in a certain area, the more it has time to exchange with particles, and the less reliable it will be. Yeah? So <clears throat> the, the strong North Atlantic, uh, uh, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation in the Western Atlantic is ideal for, looking, uh, for, for, for uh, applying the neodymium isotopes because the water mass transit times between the North Atlantic and the Southern Ocean are only on the order of about 100 years. This is super fast for, by any measures for the global ocean circulation. And therefore, it works actually best in these kind of areas. Well, it works better the far away you're from continental margins, which is clear because the, and the, the tracer enters the ocean at the margins, so you better keep away from the ocean, from the margins, and only use it as uh, in the central uh, part of the basins. And <clears throat> if the sediments are undisturbed and do not contain contaminant phases, this is also obvious. This is something that I didn't show now. I had a couple of examples because if, for example, there's basaltic particles in your sediments and you're trying to leach those sediments to obtain a deep water signature, then the basaltic particles will release its neodymium 
much more readily than, than the coatings, and therefore you get an, uh, an artificial overprinting with positive numbers if you have basalts in, in basaltic glasses in your sediments. So you have to make sure that this is also not the case. So you can see it's not a plug and play proxy. Yeah? You have to always be very much aware of potential disturbances uh, before you can really make uh, reliable, uh, can actually come up with reliable reconstructions. <coughs> and, and this is my last, my last word on this, local distributions in present day seawater need to be checked and compared to the sedimentary signature at each location, if possible. So if there is data available with which you can, you can look at the distribution in the present day water column and it makes sense there, then you have a hope to go into the sediments and do paleo reconstructions. <clears throat> this is all I wanted to say. Um, so I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, anybody had a question? We're a little bit over time, but... Oh, there was a time limit? I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, but it's fine, it's fine. It was extremely interesting and very, very important for many of our uh, students at the department. Um, yeah, Iti, go ahead. Hi, Martin. Um, thank you. It was a great talk. Very interesting. Um, I wonder when you talk about the... Uh, I have two questions, really. When you talk about the river's uh, impact on nodemium, uh, there could be two modes in which this uh, contribution happens. One is through uh, the water itself, nodemium carried in the water, and the other one is through the sediment uh, going down with the turbidity flows. What do you think is the mode that is uh, that you see in the Congo uh, and in the South Africa yeah. examples? That's one question. Well, maybe I let you answer, and then I can ask the yeah. other one. Well, it's, it's it's quite clear that the, the dissolved neodymium that the river brings, uh, a lot of that gets stuck in the estuary anyway, uh, and is immobilized there because it coagulates with the, with the iron once it meets the the seawater. <clears throat> And then actually it's stuck in the in the estuary already. So what we see here, basically the dissolved neodymium that flows out here from the Congo mouth into the open ocean, this thin fresh layer on top is mainly released from particles, from particles that the river brings, okay? Which answers also your second, your second point <clears throat> is really the particles that uh, the, the, per, the vertical transport and release from particles along the water column that actually is the dangerous point for our water mass reconstructions if you're looking at rivers. But, uh, but if, if, if you're accumulating the dimium in the sediment in the mouth of the river, then turbidity flows will potentially take a vast amount of it down below. And that could affect your paleo estimation. You wouldn't see it in a, in a, in a one-time cruise, but it might affect very strongly your nadimium uh, concentration in the <coughs> geological record. Yeah, especially, but if you're in the vicinity of the turbidity flows of a big river like the, the Congo, uh, there's, a big, uh, there's a big valley basically in the, in the Congo fan that basically goes down. I, this is the last place where I would go for actually doing water mass reconstructions because that's, that certainly makes no sense. This will be completely overprinted by the river despite the fact that it's in 4,000 meters water depth. No chance. You have to keep, you have to stay away from these areas where the, where the particles are going down slope. So following on that. The source for the global budget of neodymium. Yeah, this is because it's one of the input functions, but you, should, you have to go away from the inputs to do it, to use it as a water mass mixing tracer. Okay, so to follow that, what do you think is the source of the neodymium in the Eastern Mediterranean? Is it the Nile? The Nile is important. Cyprus. Yeah, the Nile is the Nile is one of the important uh, uh, contributors, especially also because his it's very it's very positive. It has very positive signatures, which is actually exactly fits the observations. But it's also some uh, some large basaltic outcrops in the eastern Mediter uh, Mediterranean that actually contribute material. <clears throat> uh, it's actually 
the, Med the Eastern Mediterranean is really dominated, more dominated by the inputs than by water mass mixing in the near to minimum isotopes, for sure. Uh, we did some work right now, it's about to be published on the Mediterranean. Yeah, ah. the continental shelf. We, we, we took two, two cores and, and measured it, and a lot of it is a, a recycled dust that is coming from, from the Nile Valley, uh, but also from the desert surrounding uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. It doesn't have anything to do with, uh, with uh, water mass mixing. It's all the trital inputs. Yeah, yeah, but the dust can quantitatively in the Eastern Mediterranean not play a big role on the signature because the dust is very negative in neodymium isotopes. And uh, what we see in the Eastern Mediterranean is very positive signatures. So it seems that the Nile and the basaltic inputs are dominating what we see in the water column. Yeah, we see differences uh, at uh, different periods. Uh, uh, compared, for example, the African human period compared to the Levanta vitification. And, and so it's, it's uh, again, it's a signature of the, of the uh, surrounding geology in connection with hydroclimatic uh, variations. Yeah, yeah. In the, so you mean the detrital signatures? That, that yeah. The signatures of the part. Oh, yeah, that's clear. In the detrital signature, you have clear, you can clearly see the dust inputs um, uh, from the Sahara. That's clear. Yeah. Just in this whole signature of the Mediterranean, you don't see it. Yeah. Anybody else has any question? Mm, okay. Well, we are we are quite uh, after. I will ask another one. Okay. One more. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back to the Eastern Mediterranean and the Nidimium in the Eastern Mediterranean. So basically what you would predict is that there is a, and I guess Vital can join into this conversation, that there is an Nidimium curve that would uh, be enhanced during, uh, during uh, a subpropel time and uh, should be a more uh, mild during the glacial time. Yeah, this is what exactly what you see in the in the detrital fractions, for example, deposited in the Nile fan. You see much more positive signatures during the African humid period, and then becoming more negative when there's less uh, particle contributions from the highlands, from the Ethiopian highlands. This is what's in the detrital fraction, right? Because also uh, to do water mass. To do water masses in the past from the from the Nile fan is also not possible. This is so there's so much organic material in the in the material in the in the fan sediments that it's highly reducing, and then all the rare earth elements are mobilized away. So this is mm. completely erased uh, what was there in terms of dissolved signature. But the detrital fractions uh, we've been I've been working with, with uh, Cecile Blanchet a lot, who is now in Potsdam. That Revital might know her. I know, I know the name, yeah. yeah she, <clears throat> we just have a paper now on, on uh, almost accepted with Nature Geoscience for, with a core from the Gulf of Syrte uh, of Libya, where we basically, where, uh, well, well, we, it's basically Cecile mainly who did that work, <laughs> who actually looked at the detrital fractions there. And she can see uh, <clears throat> that these, the old now dry rivers uh, across the Sahara, which are now not filled with water, they were actually, uh, you know, they were active during uh, certain humid periods um, several, several times in the past 150,000 years. And uh, she came up with the idea that these times are basically the only times when, when humans, early humans, could actually migrate in the, north, in the, in the northern Sahara, yeah, because you needed continuous uh, green areas for the people to travel over long distance at the time, which is not possible during, during conditions like today. But when there was humid periods, people could travel. And this is these, these uh, inputs of, of fluvial sediments into the Gulf of Surge, you see it very nicely in the detrital fraction again of the sediments. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that uh, accepted now? Is it uh... it's, Available. It's accepted. Uh, we're actually currently negotiating about details of the title and stuff like that with nature. This is this always takes a long time in the end, but I hope it will be out within the next couple of weeks. 
I can. I will can, be. I, can I will be happy to get a to get a copy yeah. All right. or I, I'll, even. Yeah. yeah. No problem. So I can reference it. No problem. Thank you. Okay, okay, I think I need to stop because we are really too far into uh, too much time. So thank you very much, Martin. And uh, just want to say to everybody that next week we are keeping in Germany. So um, you are invited as well, Martin. I will send you the invitation. Who is that? Uh, it's uh, Dr. Ilan Levy from MIND. Ah, okay. Okay. Good. Thank well, you very much. So thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.